Good morning students, I am again G. S. Suresh from NIE in front of you to teach design of RCC structural element 10 CV 52. Yesterday I had just introduced you what is flange section and before that I had taught you about the doubly reinforced section. Just I will have a review of what I taught you. The beam if it is restricted to its depth due to architectural reason or maybe due to other reasons, we have to provide additional steel in the compression zone due to the fact that the singly reinforced section will not be able to withstand the moment of resistance of the applied moment because of this we need to provide doubly reinforced section. The strain at the level of the compression steel is obtained from the properties of similar triangles and expressed as shown here 0 0.0035 into 1 minus d dash by x m. Then equating the total force in compression to steel, we get the neutral axis depth by the equation shown in the previous slide. The moment of resistance is obtained as the summation of the couple C u c into z 1 and C u s into z 2, where C u c shows the compressive force in concrete, C u s shows the compressive force in the compression steel. Z 1 and Z 2 are the lever arms to the compression concrete stress block and to the compressive force in the steel. Now, when we are designing, we calculate the additional moment required as m u 2 equal to m u minus m u limb. m u is the applied moment, m u limb is the moment of resistance of a singly reinforced section. The additional steel required in the compression zone is calculated as A s c equal to additional moment m u 2 divided by the stress in steel into d minus d dash which is the lever arm. F s c is the stress obtained using table f of S p 16 for different values of d dash by d it is given here. The additional tension required in the tension zone is calculated as F s c into A s c that is the compressive force in additional steel at the compression zone divided by the design stress 0.87 F y. The total steel is A s t 1 plus A s t 2. I had shown you how to do the numerical problems in the previous class. After this I introduced you to the concept of flanged beams. In most of the constructions we construct slab and beam together. This is called as monolithic construction. Hence the slab in the compression zone act as a part of the beam and this is called as T beam if it is at the intermediate portion of the slab. That is where on either side of the beam center line you have sufficient slab width. If the same thing is there on the edge of the slab where you do not have the projection of the slab on one side that is called L beam. Today I will continue in the unit 2 principles of limit state design and ultimate strength of RC section. My main objective for you to teach how to calculate 
the ultimate moment of resistance of a flange section particularly I consider only T beam because the L beam has an additional force called as torsional moment that we will treat in another separate chapter. Also I today teach you what happens to the shear force in reinforced concrete beam. So we look upon ultimate shear strength of RC beams. This photograph shows you a isolated T beam wherein this is the bridge across a river or maybe a stream of water. You need a beam and the slab to support the traffic movement. This acts as a T beam because on the top you will have the compression. So the slab in the compression zone act along with the beam form a T beam. Now we shall have to understand how the slab acts along with the beam. When the center to center of the beam is quite large, partially the slab contribute to the beam. Between the beam of the middle point of the slab as shown in the next figure, the flange of the beam will act along with the beam forming what is called as the top flange. This width of the slab is designed as the effective width of the flange. This cross section shows you how a T beam looks. This is an Im imaginary beam. In the actual monolithic construction, you do not find this cross section as it is, it will be having a continuous slab on this side and this side. You can see in this figure how the beam will have the portion of the slab acting together. At least about 25 percent of the transverse reinforcement compared to the longitudinal reinforcement should be acting along the slab to form a T beam. The IS code that is IS 456 gives the following stipulation for calculating the contribution of the slab which is called as the flange width. The slab and the rectangular beam has to be casted together effectively so that they act as one unit. As I told earlier, we cannot consider a precast construction unless you have a special provisions to have it as a T beam. As I told you already, some part of the transverse reinforcement should be there to act in the slab as a component of the flange. This diagram shows how the stress variation is there to the contribution of the beam. To some portion of the slab after the beam that I call it as BF will act along with the beam. This diagram so shows the force contribution onto the beam. Here you will have the maximum and gradually it reduces to a smaller value. So this width is called as the flange width and I, I also define the other terminology for the T beam. This is called as the flange depth DF capital D suffix F. This is called as the web. The width of the web is indicated by BW called as the web width. You are going to provide the reinforcement for singly reinforced T beam at the bottom for doubly reinforced board at the bottom at the top. The depth from the compression zone to the center of the steel is effective depth. This is the overall depth. 
there is a common question asked in the field when you say provide a beam of 230 by 600 the mason immediately ask sir does it include the thickness of the slab yes we always indicate the t beam depth including the thickness of the slab we never indicate the depth of the web so always the t beam we consider the thickness of the slab inclusive for the depth of the beam the code gives the following formulas for calculating the flange width l not is the distance between the zero point of the bending moment i'll explain you shortly on the board by 6 plus bw is the width of the web plus 6 times the depth of the flange for l beam it is l not by 12 plus bw plus 3 times df so let us look at the board how we calculate L naught. So friends if you have a simply supported beam like this subjected to any type of loading then you will have the bending moment 0 at the edges this is the effective span L. So, this itself I can call it as L naught because there I get 0 bending moment. But if you consider the case of a fixed beam or maybe in case of a continuous beam, if I write the bending moment diagram for this, this is the negative bending moment and this is the positive bending moment. So, now you can see the point of counterflexion is at the intersection of the negative bending moment and positive bending moment. So, this distance becomes L naught. Generally in this case L naught is taken as 0.7 times L that is a empirical relation developed after the observation. So, this length could be approximately 0.7 times the length. So, L naught in case of fixed beam or continuous beam is taken as 0 0.7 times L. So, let us look at uh, the slide and come to the calculation of the width of the flange in isolated T beam. Where you are casting the beam as a T shape separately and lifting it up as a precast and providing in the structure is called as the isolated T beam. It is not monolithically constructed. In such cases, BF is taken as L naught by L naught divided by B that is width of the web plus 4. That is here the B is the actual width of the flange. B is to be replaced by BF if it is flange. In case of L beam, this BF is L naught into 0.5 divided by L naught by B plus 4 plus BW. So, this you get in chapter 3 of the IS 456. Let us continue to understand how we do the calculation for the analysis of T beam. It depends on the position of the neutral axis. The neutral axis position depends on the quantity of steel, the geometrical size of the T beam that is flange width, web width and the effective depth. Depending on this, I can consider two positions of the neutral axis. One is in the flange. If the neutral axis passes through the flange, then part of the flange and the web becomes useless and because they are under tension. Now, it becomes a rectangular beam of size flange width into the neutral axis depth. 
that we should avoid because we are not utilizing the capacity of the web. So, we have to adjust the area of steel and the depth such that the neutral axis lies in the web. The flange and the rectangular portion of the neutral axis depth is designed similar to a rectangular beam when the neutral axis lies in the flange. As I said, we try to avoid this. Here, you can clearly see a diagram showing you a general strain diagram and the stress diagram. The portion of the rectangular part of the stress block whether it lies within the flange or partially in the flange or partially in the web will make the calculation difference that I am going to explain to you very shortly. When we are analyzing the ultimate strength of the T beam, we use the same assumption as given in 3.4.2 of the code. The compressive strain is assumed to be 0 0.002 where it seizes the parabolic portion and maximum is 0 0.0035. It is very important to calculate the depth h of the beam where the strain is 0 0.002 that is where the rectangular portion of the stress block lies, whether it completely lies within the flange or partially in the flange or partially in the web. The relation between d f and d is used to calculate the value of h by using the similar triangle property and the stress block property we can calculate the h value as shown here as 0.197 d for mild steel and for hysd bar it is approximately 0.2 so if the h by d ratio is 0.2 then we can say that the rectangular portion of the stress block is within the flange. The maximum value of h may be greater or equal to d f that is the thickness of the slab. The thickness of the flange is considered small if d f by d is less than 0 0.2. So, based on this we do the calculation of moment of resistance. If it is greater, then we have to consider partially the stress block rectangular portion in flange and the web. Similarly, for under reinforced flange beams, the ratio of d f by x u has to be in place of d f by d, wherein in the first point here I have shown you for balanced and over reinforced section x u may exceed x u max, but we consider it to be equal to x u max. If d f by d x u is less than 0 0.43 that is I am replacing the value of h by x u and I say that if d f by x u is 0.43 the rectangular portion of stress block is in the full depth of the flange otherwise part is in flange and part is in the web. Now, I have got three cases with me to analyze if I can calculate the neutral axis depth if it lies in the flange it is simply a rectangular section of size b f by x u 
by replacing this to B and D in our singly reinforced rectangular section. So, what is the Q limb B D squared in this case? Q limb remains same. Instead of B, I use B F that is the flange width. Second case wherein X U is greater than D F and D F by D is less than or equal to 0.2. So, that means to say that the rectangular stress block is in the flange. How do I do the calculation? Now, you can see here I divide the T beam into two parts. One part is the web that is having width B w and the depth as effective depth D. I calculate the moment of resistance separately for this by using the rectangular section formula. Then I have the two flanges 2 2 I have written. So, the width of this part 2 is each part is B f minus B w that is the flange width minus the web width divided by 2 and if you put together it becomes B f minus B w. So, using this I calculate the neutral axis depth by equating the compressive force of the portion 1 that where I have indicated 1 in my previous figure and 2 into the force of portion 2. So, here I have 0.36 FCK BW with this BW XU limb. Now, I have the flange portion wherein 0.45 FCK BF minus BW instead of BW here I replace by 2 times B f minus B w divided by 2 into D f is the thickness of the flange. The tensile force is simple design stress into A s t. Design stress is 0 0.87 F y A s t is area of steel. So, for balance section I can calculate m u limb as 0.36 f c k b w x u limb into d minus 0.42 x u limb and for the flange portion 0.45 f c k b f minus b w into d f and the liver arm is d minus d f by 2. This is how I calculate m u limb. You can see here the third case wherein the neutral axis is such that the part of the rectangular stress block comes down to the web. In this case I calculate with the same technique, but part of the rectangular stress block is in the web. So, for this we use what is called as equivalent rectangular stress block the depth of the rectangular stress block is called Y f and that is calculated by using the formula Y f equal to 0.15 x u plus 0.65 times d f. This is the depth of the equivalent stress block. All these details are given in appendix D of I s 456 2000. You can refer to this. Actually, if you calculate, you get instead of 0.15, you get 0.142, and instead of 0.65, you get 0.67. With this small correction, we can calculate the compressive force from our good old formula of 0.36 FCK BW into XU limb plus 0.45 FCK. B f minus B w this is the flange portion instead of D f I have here Y f. Y f is the depth of the rectangular stress block. T is 0 0.875 into F y into A s t and I calculate M u limb by taking the rectangular 
moment of resistance plus the flange wherein for the flange I use YF this is case 3. Case 4 I can have the case 4 when XU actual stress calculated is greater than XU max and the depth of the flange when df by xu is less than or equal to 0.43 i use the equation of the case 2 and for case 3 i use for xu max in place of xu for df by xu greater than 0.43 let us try to understand all these equations, computations through the first example on T beam. I do two problems or two types of problems. One is on the moment of resistance, another is on finding the area of steel for a given moment. A detailed design will be dealt in design of beams wherein we use the design formula or SP 16 special publication 16 to calculate the required parameters for the design. Friends we have the first problem with the data flange width is 1000 mm, width of the web is 300 mm, effective depth is 450 mm and the thickness of the slab is 100 mm. The area of steel provided on the tension zone is 1963 mm squared of type Fe415, concrete is M20, effective cover is 50 mm. I calculate the neutral axis depth with an assumption that the neutral axis lies in the flange. This is to be done by trial and error. If the calculated value of XU is greater than neutral axis depth that is the flange thickness, then you have to redo the calculation by considering the flange and the web. So now it is becomes a simple rectangular section. For rectangular section I have the equation for XU by equating the concrete force compression force to the tensile force which I used earlier in singly reinforced section. XU equal to 2.42 into Fy by Fck into Ast by B. Substituting the value of Fy, Ast, Fck and B, I get the depth of the neutral axis as 98.5 just above the bottom of the flange. It is less than the thickness of the slab. Therefore, the neutral axis lies in the flange. So my assumption is correct. Then the moment of resistance is very simple 0.36 Fck Bf Xu into D minus 0.42 Xu. You can also do this by 0.87 Fy Ast into D minus 0.42 Xu. You get the same answer. So the moment of resistance is 290 kilo Newton meter. Second problem as I told you it is similar to a design problem for a given moment I have to calculate the area of steel but in this problem I am calculating for the moment of resistance what is the area of steel required. So that is I am going to calculate the moment of resistance corresponding to a balance section. The flange width is same as in the previous problem 1000 mm, the web width is 300 mm, effective depth is 450 mm. 
and the thickness of the slab is 100. Steel is of type Fe415, concrete is M20, cover is 50. So, first I calculate whether the rectangular portion of the stress block is within a flange or not. So, here it shows the depth of the flange is 100, effective depth is 450, gives you 0.22 which is greater than 0.2, hence I have to use case 3. For that I have to calculate Yf equal to 0.15 Xu max plus 0.65 Df. So, X u max is 0.48 d which is 216 mm greater than the thickness of the flange or the slab and I substitute X u max equal to 216 in the above equation. I get the y f that is the depth of the stress block as 97.4 the rectangular portion which is within the flange. So, equating the compression force and the tension force. This is for the web portion up to the top of the concrete extreme fiber and this is the flange portion. I get the value of A S T lim as 2991.7 mm square. Then I calculate the moment of resistance for limiting value q lim into b d squared that is what you get from this and this is for the portion of the flange. Use this equation substitute the value of uh, all the parameters shown you get the value of the moment of resistance as 413.87 kilo Newton meter. I will take up the third problem wherein I am going to do the design for a given moment of the value. Sorry, in this problem it is not the moment I am finding the moment of resistance wherein I have the flange width is 1200 mm and the width of the web is 300 mm, effective depth is 560 mm and the slab thickness is 100 mm. The steel is of Fe415, area of steel is 3696 mm square, concrete is M20, effective cover is 50 mm. First always we check Df by D. So, now it is less than 0.2 therefore, it is case 2. Then I take the compressive force and the tensile force from which I calculate x u as 242.8 and x u max from I s 456 is 0.48 d for M 20 concrete and F e 415 steel. Hence, I get x u as a less than x u max. In the next step, I calculate the moment of resistance wherein I take same equation as I showed you earlier. I substitute the values you can see here F c k B w and x u. I will get this value of m u limit as 595.6 kilo Newton meter. In the last problem in the T beam, I am going to show you how to calculate the area of steel required for a moment of 400 kilo Newton meter, where the flange width is 1650, web width is 250, overall depth or the effective depth is 500 and the thickness of the slab is 100 mm. I use Fe415 and M20 material. First, I calculate x u max which is 240 mm, then m u lim I calculate from the same old formula which I showed you which comes to 739.45. Then what I do is 
I do a trial and error procedure, I start with calculating the steel as an approximate steel by taking the liver arm as D minus D F by 2, moment divided by 0.87, this is a singly reinforced under reinforced section. So, I use area of steel force here and I take this as the liver arm 500 effective depth minus the depth of the flange divided by 2, I get an approximate area. For this I use 5 of 25 mm dia bars. So, divide 2462 by 491, you get 4 point something, I take it as 5 which is 2455 which is slightly less than 2462, but it is the approximation we are doing, we can accept it. But we shall check whether it is really having the moment of resistance greater than the applied moment. You calculate the neutral axis depth from this equation of uh, 2.42 F i by F c k to A s t by B, you get that in the flange. So, within the flange, so the section is under reinforced and I calculate by using m u equal to 0.87 f y a s t into d minus 0.42 x u. Earlier, I was using this as x u limb to calculate the limiting moment of resistance. So, this is the actual under info section moment. So far, we have studied the beam under flexure. I had shown you three types of analysis, one is singly reinforced section, second is doubly reinforced section, the third is the flanged section in which particularly I am concentrating on the T beam. Now, we shall look into the other aspects of the design, any beam cannot have pure flexure, it will be always associated with another force called as the shear force. The force acting tangential to the cross section is called as the shear force. This force induces what is called as the shear stress. So, let us have a look at the content of this slide. It says that the shear force in a beam is because of the change in the bending moment along the length. That is, V is equal to dm by dx. That is the relation we had taught to you in strength of materials. As I told you earlier, neither the shear nor the bending moment act independently they act together. Hence, we have to consider the shear along with the flexure. Generally, in design, the strength is gone by flexure. That means, I design the beam both reinforcement and the depth considering the bending moment and I check whether the applied shear force causing any additional stresses which may damage the section. You should not allow the beam to fail due to shear, because this will cause tensile stress in the concrete, which is having a adverse effect of sudden failure that is brittle failure. Most of the codes in the world follow the relationship obtained from the laboratory tests. They give some empirical formulas. The stresses caused due to the shear and the bending give rise to what is called as principal stress. For that, we shall see this uh, element. These, they, I have considered three elements here, 
first element is in the top that is above the neutral axis. It is a small element of area d a which is subjected to compressive force f c due to bending that is given by this formula f is equal to m y by i before it cracks. Of course, I am considering the section right now for a homogeneous material. I assume the concrete has not cracked. Let us see after this how it happens in case of RCC beam which cracks. Then near the neutral axis it is pure shear. The element is subjected to only shear stress. It is not subjected to the compressive force or the tensile force because there the bending stress is 0. In the tension zone the same element is subjected to tensile force in the axial direction and shear stress as shown here. F t indicates the tensile stress not feet, F c indicates the compressive force. The flexural stress varies linearly from 0 to maximum at the compression extreme fiber. The shear stress varies linearly rather parabolically from 0 at the extreme edges and maximum at the neutral axis. Let me recall on the board to you how we write the shear stress diagram for a rectangular beam. If this is the rectangular beam, we used to write the shear stress like this. Here, this is the tau max. So, this is how we calculate the shear stress diagram. Now, we shall see the equations used. The equation used for calculating the shear is shear force, I call it as F or V into area above the point of consideration into Y bar is the neutral axis depth. I will show you this on the board now divided by moment of inertia into B. The explanation on this, suppose I want to calculate the shear stress, this is the shear stress Q I am considering. Here, this depth you take it as y and this is the portion which I have to consider for this is the area A and this portion is y dot or y bar. So, this is the portion where I am calculating the value of Q and I am considering A as this area hatched portion y bar is the center of this hatched portion from the neutral axis. I hope uh, you can remember this what we had taught you in strength of materials. Let us now go to the RCC part now, wherein the concrete cracks the variation of shear stress across the depth is complex. That shear diagram I will show you on the board that consists of the shear stress in the compression zone will have parabolic and then in the tension zone it will be rectangular like this. It would not come back to 0 as in the case of homogeneous material. IS 456 simplifies the calculation as done in other codes they call it as the nominal shear stress instead of going to F A Y bar divided by I B, we calculate the normal shear stress as tau V equal to V U by B D, B into the effective depth. This is called as the nominal shear stress. The nominal shear strength tau V should not exceed a maximum value given as tau c max in the code. This is given in table 20, page 73 of IS 456. 
whatever may be the reinforcement you are providing for the shear, you should not exceed the value of tau c max. If it happens, you increase the depth. If tau v is greater than tau c max, then you revise the section. You increase the depth generally. Then to take care of the shear, which produces principal tensile stress in the portion of the concrete, we provide the shear reinforcement. The shear reinforcement is in the form of either vertical stirrups or in the form of bent up bar. This I will show you on the board how this looks. You can see if this is the rectangular beam and you are providing the reinforcement in the tension zone to take care of hanging the reinforcement that is particularly stirrups, we provide what is called as hanger bars. And this will be bent in this fashion in the field, but it is always better to provide a hook like this in case of earthquake zones. So, this is called as vertical stirrups. And this is what you are going to take care in the shear. Now, we shall see the same thing what we can do with other than the stirrups also. If you see in the elevation, this is the beam and it is supported on either side and this is the tension reinforcement. You provide additional reinforcement, partly it can go to the support and partly it is cranked. This is called as cranked bar and this angle is generally taken as 45 degrees. And in addition, you provide a hanger bar on the top and you are going to provide what is called as the stirrups. This is vertical stirrups. So, two types of shear reinforcement I have shown. One is the vertical stirrup and another is the bent up bar. Due to some advantages sometimes we provide the stirrups in inclined fashion from 45 degrees to 60 degrees. In that case, it is the inclined stirrup. This is a very special case where generally we do not use. So, coming back to the understanding on the design, shear reinforcement in the form of stirrups or cranked bars is provided to take care of diagonal tension that is the principal tensile stress developed. The design shear strength of concrete, the concrete can contribute to the shear stress which can be taken as equal to the shear force generated by the tension reinforcement bar and also in the concrete and also in the compression reinforcement which can put together be called as tau c. This is given in table 19 of IS 456. This table shows here this is for the percentage of steel provided in the tension zone at the mid span. For this percentage of steel for different grade of concrete what is the tau c allowed is given here. This table shows the maximum tau c max for M20 concrete it is 2.8. So, what is the procedure we do? If tau v is less than 
tau c then we provide the normal nominal shear reinforcement which is given in page 48 clause 26.5.16 as asv by bsv greater than or equal to 0.4 divided by 0.87 fy when tau v is greater than tau c then we design the shear reinforcement if it is less we do not design the reinforcement we provide normal nominal shear reinforcement the applied ultimate shear force is resisted by both concrete and steel therefore i write the applied shear force vu as vcu plus vsu so vcu is equal to tau c into bd that is the permissible stress shear stress of the concrete multiplied by b into d so for different shear reinforcement how do we calculate this vus for vertical stirrups 0.87 fy into asv into d divided by sv this asv is area of the vertical stirrup so let us see how i calculate this if you see the stirrup the stirrup is in the form of legs this is called as two leg stirrup if you provide the stirrup in a single leg it is called as single leg stirrup this is one leg for this if the diameter of this bar is phi then i calculate asv is equal to 2 times pi by 4 into dia square whereas for this i calculate this as pi by 4 into dia square here i multiply by 2 because there are two legs suppose i introduce one more leg then it becomes 3 introduce four legs it becomes 4 so area of steel for the stirrup is calculated like this for inclined stirrups the same formula will be having additional coefficients from sin alpha plus cos alpha where alpha is the inclination for single bent up cranked bar it is 0.87 fy into asv into sin alpha where asv in that case is area of one bar suppose you provide three bars then the whole thing you multiply by three alpha is the inclination generally taken as 45 from research it has been found that alpha can be provided from 45 to 60 degrees where there are more than one type of shear reinforcement is used then you, you should not take the total shear resistance as from one bar you have to add all the three suppose all all the different bars suppose you have providing vertical stirrup cranked bar and also inclined stirrup take all of them independently and find out but when you are using the bent up bar the code stipulates that the maximum contribution of this shear resistance shall not be more than the half that of the total shear stress or the shear force resisted that means it should not exceed 0.5 times vu suppose you calculate vus from the above formula you will get say 50 kilo Newton and the total shear force is only 60 then you have to take this as 30 only 60 divided by 2 and one more point I want to clarify here generally what we do is we do the reverse calculation we calculate the spacing SV SV is the spacing between the stirrups this is calculated by taking VUS down and what is the spacing of the stirrup that is if you go back to the board and check this value this distance is called as sv that is calculated from this formula okay so now we shall just uh, look at what is the procedure we follow in designing the rcc beam for shear the ultimate shear force acting at vertical section that is d from the face of the support is calculated as vu for safe we will take it to be at the support you calculate vu so how do you calculate in case of a simply supported beam 
subjected to UDL? It is WL by 2. In case of cantilever, it is WL. So, calculate the nominal shear stress as ASV by BSV greater than or equal to 0.4 by 0.87 FY whenever tau V is less than or equal to tau V max. From the flexural design result, we calculate PT as 100 AST by BD and obtain the shear strength tau C from the table 19. If tau C is less than tau V, rather tau V is less than tau C, we do not provide the designed shear reinforcement. If tau V is less than tau C, then I calculate SV from this formula. The reinforced concrete slab, so that is the design procedure we are adopting and I will show you numerical problems in the next class which will be my last class and there I will show you how to calculate the shear reinforcement. So, as quickly I will go through the summary. We have defined what is T beam and L beam in the earlier slides. So, this is L beam and this is the T beam and in the T beam the stress pattern is in this pattern and we have the point not not 2 that is the strain at which it becomes horizontal the stress strain diagram that should be whether it within the flange or not. And after designing the beam for flexure we check for the shear. So, concrete has a limited shear capacity. So, we require the minimum vertical stirrups given in the code and IS 456 has also given the design equation for the shear for different types of the stirrups class 40.4 can be referred for this. So, that is all for today. I hope uh, you have understood the concept of shear and also flanged beam. Have a nice day. We will meet again next week to complete my portion of unit 2. Thank you.